Every year in a temperate forest, there's a wave of growth that comes in and out like the tide, where imperceptibly in the background of your day, the leaves are growing in or decaying back, and all you can really see is the wash of growth come in with spring and die back with autumn. And every month in between has its own particular feel. And the result of that can be a bit dramatic, because our forest isn't like most forests we're used to, where there's a uniformity to the height and shape, or the canopy has closed and you lose a lot of three-dimensionality. The growth here is much denser. We've got growth from floor to sky, and whole walls of green can show up in a few short weeks. And spaces that felt like an empty room can quickly become verdant jungles. And then spaces that felt like they were tucked away in some tropical rainforest and could never be anything but that verdant green die back and you're left wondering how. And each corner of the land can go through changes like that a handful of times every year. It's almost like there are a few different ecosystems superimposed on each other, and you can only really get to view each if you wait patiently through the seasons. Because when you don't visit a corner of your land for a few weeks, when you go back, you're not returning to the same place you left. There's different active insects, different temperatures, amounts of light, growth, soil activity. It's a different place entirely. Which makes it clear to me that a forest isn't just one thing. A forest is many ecosystems. And that's what this video will be about. How does a forest change over the course of a year, and what types of things affect that change? January and February of 2022 really set the tone for the rest of the year, as that's the portion of the year when we're supposed to get the majority of the year's rain. It's when the water table is supposed to be charged and the soil temperatures are cool enough that rains will actually soak into the ground. And this year, we just didn't get those. We started it off instead with a drought, which in these parts, to get a drought during winter is unheard of. And without that rain and the clear sky warming the landscape, a lot of trees started to leave a bit earlier than they usually do. I even remember looking at some elderberries budding and thinking, I really hope you know something I don't because it's still cold. But I guess they did because that serious frost and cold I was afraid of never really came and, and spring started earlier than any year I've seen. Usually we'll get our first 20 degree day in March, but this year it happened in early February, a month ahead of schedule. So by the time March actually rolled in with those warmer temperatures and with a bit of rain, spring went wild. Everything not only grew really strong, but came in about a month ahead of schedule. So by April already, as the leaves came in, we were already losing a few meters of visibility every few weeks. And really the whole weather pattern was so all over the place because we went from clear skies in winter to cloudy with a small amount of rain in early spring, and that really pushed everything back. And it's months like these when the weather patterns can't really pick a direction that really demonstrate the necessity to not rely on any single species, but instead to cast a wide net. And I think this weirding is part of the reason we've planted so many species here, because no matter what the weather brings, there should always be a few species that thrive and produce. And you can really see this on a yearly scale with drought tolerant species or species that thrive when there's too much water. But you can also see this play out on a scale of many years because we don't know what the future will bring and we could either become a subtropical land like the south of Portugal where species like avocado and macadamia begin to really thrive or we could grow into a future where frosts become stronger and we start to rely on species like oak and pecan. By May, average temperatures were well into the 20s and the growth was out of control, with most species really in the heart of their growth spurts for the year and the forest 
really beginning to take on the look that most of us expect when we think of a forest, this dense growth and beautiful vibe that gets that primordial part of us that evolved in a forest feeling right at home. So you can really start walking around and just feel safe. The growth is so intense at this point of the year that we really have to start managing paths every couple of weeks. Because if we don't, certain portions of the land would just become inaccessible. So since we prefer to let the majority of the land grow wild, leaving space for native plants to establish themselves, taking care of these paths gives us a web of access that lets us maneuver our way with minimal disturbance to wherever we need to go, while still getting the benefits of allowing nature to act as they see fit. By July, we're finally in the only portion of the year where we in temperate climates can enjoy a complete jungle vibe. Everything's been growing long enough that the whole forest is filled out. Blackberry is really starting to ramp up after being completely cut back in September of 2021. Bushes and trees are starting to co-mingle so you can't tell quite where one starts and the other ends and ferns are overtaking spring grasses and growing way taller than I ever expected ferns to grow. If we didn't step on them a few times in a year to build soil, there would be a continuous green growth from the soil straight up and through into the crowns of the trees. And all this growth together really creates this atmosphere of a jungle, which means that it stays really cool inside the forest. Despite the summer being probably the hottest ever on record across all of Europe, inside the forest you could barely tell. And it's nothing like the local woods next door where, in a pine forest for example, so much light gets through that it's almost as scorching inside the forest as outside. But here, with such dense growth and so much diversity of leaves, the temperature was never unbearable. And honestly, I would forget how hot it was until I stepped out of the forest into the heat, and I'd wonder why I'd ever live in anything but a forest, which was just so cool and damp by comparison. Another interesting thing about summer this year was that it actually rained pretty frequently. But the rains were so light, and it was so hot that it didn't matter because the soil was just too hot to accept that water, so the surface would get wet for an afternoon or maybe a day, but it wouldn't actually get to soak in, and it would immediately just evaporate as soon as the heat of the afternoon would come in. In a plantation I made at a friend's place last year where they have drip irrigation running regularly, the trees with the smallest roots actually did the best because as they kept the surface wet all summer long, those superficial roots were really drinking well, but some hazels that I also planted with substantially deeper roots actually had to drop all of their leaves in order to preserve water. So it really kind of shows how the water is just on the surface, and once you go in just a few centimeters, how dry things really are. And I think that shows how difficult the summer was, where even irrigation was sometimes not enough. Which makes the most interesting point to me, though, that while the surrounding land suffered a bit, the majority of the forest is getting to a point where they don't need us to water anymore. And of course any watering we do is appreciated, and there's a few small trees we've planted in the past few years that still really benefit from our watering, but no one's dying from drought anymore. And in this year, which was so spectacularly dry and hot, it was really quite impressive. Most previous years, in September and October, there's been a descent from summer into autumn, where the strength of summer's growth dies back in a few weeks, and it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that summer is leaving us. But this year, summer lingered well into October, with temperatures staying into the upper 20s, and the trees seemed to really respond to that. They waited a bit longer than usual to start letting their leaves die back and lose their vigor. So we kept that jungly beauty a bit longer than we have any previous year. And that was pretty nice for us because we can be a bit lazy when it comes to harvesting. I personally find it much more enjoyable to grow food than I do to harvest it. And it's not that I don't think it's not a lovely task, it's just not my favorite. So. 
as the nuts sat on the ground for entirely too long, waiting for us to come harvest them, the lack of rain really helped with their preservation. Another large task we undertook this year during these months was the shaping of the blackberry hedges. This year we've taken it a bit more serious than others as we've made the choice to begin subdividing the land into a bunch of smaller sections with the idea being that now that the trees are big enough, at some point we'll be able to introduce dwarf goats and start rotating them through the forest. So it's really satisfying to see these hedges pop up around the land, but it also made it very clear that autumn was gone and the jungle is done for the year. In the few weeks it takes to cut all the blackberry down, the tide of growth goes out faster than at any other point in the year, and the majority of the growth disappears into the soil. Finally, in November, the drought ended. The past two months have been mostly rain and a return to the type of winter we should expect in this region. So, namely, rain. November was almost entirely rain, and as long as it continues to rain as frequently as it has been, the longer we'll be protected from the real frigid temperatures of winter. Winter rains are especially important to us because as long as it's raining, it's not frosting. And it's only on clear days when it's not raining that the temperatures will ever go below freezing. And even though it's usually just a few hours in the coldest moments of the morning, just before sunrise, that little window of frost is enough to burn our sensitive tropicals. So we really appreciate this winter rain. By early December, about a month earlier than we usually get it, we've got our first frost this year. When we first arrived here 10 years ago, there used to be morning fogs that would rise up from the river and protect us from frost, but as the water tables in the whole region lower year after year, and with the subsequent lower humidity in the air, those fogs have gotten lower as well, and we are consistently above the fog line, which leaves us open to those frosts. And though some species like chayote are adapted to it by now, completely losing their leaves each year and growing back vigorously in the spring, there are species like avocado and ice cream bean which can be set back a few years if the frost gets them. So we also build a lot of individual greenhouses during this time of year. And though it's safer for them to survive the winter, it does make the forest kind of a less pretty space in my opinion. But as the sun drops to its lowest point, it is getting cold. And of course there's a few stragglers like the pecan which kind of laughs at our winters and might hold its leaves into mid-January. By the end of December, most leaves have dropped and the entirety of that tide has gone out. Reviewing the footage of the year to make this video has been really interesting. It's brought me back much clearer to all those changes in the year. Up until this year, the most satisfaction we've had is when we get visitors, people who maybe met the land a few months before, who'd return to visit and just not recognize anything, as if they were in a completely different place. So now to have that visual proof that that cauliflower used to be there, or you couldn't see a few steps ahead of you in any direction, and now you can see as far as you want, it's really entertaining. I don't know what to call it, but I think what I feel looking back at the footage is something like the sort of pride a parent feels when their child gets to a certain age and they start to make their own choices and take care of themselves, because in reality by this point we're mostly observers in the forest. We make alterations, but most of those things that we change are things that we want to see in the land by this point. They're not things that the land really needs anymore. And she's finally reached a point where she might even be fine on her own. 